In 2022, 274 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Preventing, mitigating and responding to humanitarian crises is a challenge. Can fiction and storytelling play a role? Can it raise awareness and motivate action to address the causes and consequences of humanitarian crises? My name is Ruth Mukwana and I host the Saha podcast, Stories and Humanitarian Action. Welcome to the Saha podcast, Stories and Humanitarian Action. I have a great guest for you today, but before I introduce her, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and if you enjoy today's conversation, like, comment, and share it. My guest today is Annie Kazarian, who is a writer and professional development coach, both of which she believes come down to clarifying our vision and following our intuition. Her publications include book reviews, essays, and short stories that have been featured in Consequence Magazine, Agni Online, Samposonia Way, Asta Nine Journal, and a Tishman Review. Welcome, Annie, to the conversation today. Thank you. Hi, Ruth. It's nice to be here. Um, so you write essays, short stories, and book reviews. Um, are there any particular topics or themes that you write about? Um, I think so much of what I've always been interested in, um, in both reading and writing, is um, the idea of our inner power, our internal power, and um, kind of the ways in which in the world um, as we know it today that we um, lose belief in our internal power and the ways in which we rebuild that. To me, I think a lot of the great literature that's written is um, we watch that character development go from a level of disempowerment to self-empowerment. I think that's what character development is. Um, and I think always I've been interested in, in writing about that and understanding the ways in which we empower ourselves through life in different contexts. Um, at right. least that's what I've tried to accomplish in, in my work. Right. And what inspires you? Um, that's, a, that's a big question. I think wanting to, um, you know, I think about writing it as a way of understanding myself, um, which I think understanding ourselves is what helps us understand one another. You know, the more I, I know myself, the more I can understand you. I think for me, it's really that, that exercise in um, finding a way to be in this world. And, um, and I, I feel that doing that through writing is, is a powerful exercise. And also I have, um, I have stories in me that um, I've always had. I think they come from uh, all the people I've ever met, all the books I've ever read, everything, and it just creates characters and ideas that need a way out. Right. The feeling of getting those out of my own head is is inspiring enough to write. <laughs> right. No, and I can relate to that as well. Um, and we were speaking earlier, but also I was reading, you know, on your website, you started a company, and yes. as we were speaking earlier. I know you mentioned actually that uh, the work you're doing uh, within your company is also related to your writing. And maybe you can talk to me more about that. Sure. Thank you. Um, so the, the premise of my company is I have these three principles that I think apply. Uh, mostly I work with um, entrepreneurs, professionals, and um, executives of small companies, like less than 50 people. And um, what I do is coach them in releasing kind of the, the fear in the decision making process and um, which then, you know, builds community and um, increases efficiency, basically, when we can make decisions more out of love and things that we believe in rather than what we're afraid of. But I have three principles um, that I've kind of narrowed down on, and I believe this is what drives my, um, what I hope to accomplish in my writing. And it's also what I'm so 
coach people and and it's the first being that the purpose of life is to unfold our potential in mind body and soul so if that's the purpose of life then we see it as potential something that's always unfolding so we never um we never have a point in which we end but we always strive to learn and grow because one thought leads to another and one act leads to another and it becomes um so that gives us purpose and so everything that we do the the purpose beyond behind that would be um you know is this unfolding my potential Mm -hmm. is this contributing to the unfoldment of potential and then the second being um that all life is equal and the third being that we all win or no one wins Right. And I think those three, um, so I coach people in implementing these principles in their companies or in their work and in their business. Um, and that's really the, I think the premise of how I, how I view life. And I think a lot of the writing is trying to understand how those principles apply in different contexts. Right. Well, I, you know, honestly, these are all very powerful principles, um, to think about and I guess I mean to me listening to you as well I feel like these are principles that help us also to create uh, a much better world I mean if we saw all lives as equal and sometimes I I feel especially dealing with the humanitarian crisis where the numbers of people affected are so big but the level of assistance so low there's always that question around you know do all lives are they all equal you know are we paying the same level of attention and providing the same level of assistance to those who are in need. Yes. And I know that we aren't as a global society. Uh, And I always, uh, one thing I I think about often is how, how can we get there? How can we, how can we get to the point as a global society? How can we get to the point of really understanding that all life is equal? Um, like one thing I always think of the the Dalai Lama has a quote: um, "No one is special, but everyone is essential." Mm-hmm. Wow! And that, that it feels so true to me. Yeah. Um, if we can get to a place of really viewing that, you know, as individuals, as groups, as nations, if we could really embody that principle. Yeah. And which brings me to the the question around writing generally as well. Um, So in the podcast, you know, I'm hoping that um, through these conversations, there can be more awareness around humanitarian crisis across the world, wherever they are and how people are impacted by them. But I'm hoping that fiction can do this. And that's why I'm trying to see how do we talk about stories and and novels and really ask um, the people I speak to, can fiction raise awareness? Can it mo- motivate action to address the causes and consequences of humanitarian crisis? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I, um, I, I think about this often because when there is humanitarian crisis, it's, it requires immediate attention and immediate um, solutions, which fiction, I don't, I don't think it provides that other than sometimes for me, provides immediate comfort or inspiration but for the physical needs that are present in a crisis I don't think it does that but I also have been thinking about things a little bit differently um, in that when a crisis plays out and um, and I'm reading about it or understanding about it through different sources and I'm not in it but it's um it seems to me that a lot of times, by the time we know about it, we're about 10 years too late, right. at least. That the things that needed to happen to have prevented it were, were long ago. And I think that's where fiction comes in. Right. And I think, um, I think both are needed. We have to have the immediate response, but we also have to have the long-term vision. Right. In that, um, I believe what fiction does is it, it changes perspectives. Mm-hmm. Like maybe that can fiction can be a catalyst to really understanding that all life is equal, Mm -hmm. but I do believe that takes generations, Um, and I think fiction's role might be in in moving that along and having 
a faith that in generations to come will be closer to having that perspective, which then would allow us to do the preemptive work of preventing crises before they right. occur or mitigating the impact, at least being prepared to mitigate the impact of it. Right. And you're absolutely right. I mean, what we see or what I certainly see is that indeed I think it, what we really advocate for a lot is prevent. And if you can't prevent, prepare and mitigate, um, especially when it comes to natural disasters and now climate change and all of this. And then, of course, when it comes to war itself again, just don't don't start a war, right? <laughs> like, how do we prevent um, people from starting wars? Because also what we have seen, what history has really illustrated, it's easy to start a war, but it's so difficult to end a war. And they tend to go on for years and years and years. But part of the reason I was really trying to see, you know, can fiction do something? Can it raise awareness? Um, can it help? I think part of it, I think, is the challenge around how do you communicate these numbers um, of people in need, sometimes in really far away places, mm. in a way that people can even connect uh, yes. or think about them uh, and maybe also understand uh, the impact of uh, what people are going through, the trauma of war and violence? Yes. I think, um, I think in that sense, absolutely fiction or a narrative in general, a nonfiction. Or, um, you know, the most recent example we have now is uh, the war in Ukraine. And um, we're seeing with social media, uh, people are responding differently. And I think it's because there is this opportunity to share these very specific moments in short snippets that can get to people, um, perhaps in a way that narrative wasn't able to before. Um, I think that too is tricky to say because there's still so much that goes into it, you know, um, because there are other crises happening and other wars at the same time that aren't receiving the same recognition or um, platform. So I don't know. So I think that it, that shows us that there is an avenue to reach people, but there is still um, a level of familiarity mm -hmm. that plays a role. And that I don't know how to overcome. Right. That I, I I think about that all the time. How can how does narrative impact the that? And I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, I, I I like to kind of like talk to people about all of this, as you can imagine, and and because I've been talking to a lot of writers, particularly, but also uh, readers and humanitarian practitioners, and. Mm -hmm. And then I've also been reading all of this uh, work that's been done by a lot of experts on questions around compassion and empathy and how do we connect. Um, and it seems to me from all of, you know, talking to people and just reading, there's something about, like, how do we connect with people we don't know? Is it about emotions? Is it about our feelings, these things that people say love is universal, no matter where you are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's everyone loves, feels love, loves for family, love for partners, love for pets, uh, friendship. Um, so there's something about people talking about, like, how do we connect? And that's another question I'm always asking, like, how do you really connect people to care mm -hmm. about people they've never met or they've never even thought about and perhaps will never meet in their life. Yeah, I think, I mean, you bring up a really good point. Love is universal. Maybe the demonstration of love is what differs, right. but it, the feeling ultimately is. And I think maybe in that sense, what literature does, um, as we were saying earlier, you know, uh, it helps to um, it helps to know yourself better. So if I'm aware of the ways in which I'm conditioned, um, 
maybe it'll create that buffer so um, so that when I have a feeling, whether it's a positive or a negative, I can filter it through. Is this a conditioned? Um, is this being filtered through con- something that's conditioned in me, or is this um, is this what the person is really communicating to me at this moment? Is can I understand what this person is experiencing in the moment, or am I making an assumption? based on something I have been conditioned to think. So I think literature does increase our own awareness of our own thought processes. And maybe in that way, um, it will allow us. But again, I think that's, so I think, are you thinking maybe like, is there one, um, is there a way of like one piece of literature to immediately call act to action? Or is it kind of, can it be like a long-term I think um, I think my struggle is I want to believe that it can yeah. do it immediately. But all my experience tells me it takes time. Yeah, I agree agree with you, and um, I I do believe that fiction can raise awareness. Um, I think that is something I believe because I think like especially um, literary fiction. Uh, that is rooted in, in, in reality. So I feel like that kind of fiction, if you read a book set in Afghanistan that is realistic, it will allow you to be curious and know something about what's going on in the country, even if it's fictionalized. But to me, it also does something about, if you're in the mindset, and I think you said it a bit earlier when you're saying, you know, like, for you, fiction allows character development so the growth of of mm. of, of you know of, of someone of this character and i feel to me fiction is very powerful in that way that most of the characters that are fully developed are not one thing they are not either or there are so many things and mm. so through it i kind of feel one is able to really get and kind of really deep in depth way of seeing how this character is really affected by war but at the same time perhaps they're also going through trauma maybe they're also going through divorce and it kind of to me opens up that world where one can see this character in all of their entire being and maybe some elements of that one can relate to now (laughs) can it motivate action that's the part where i don't know (laughs) that's the part where I I don't know but I'm also working with uh, a few colleagues uh, Adrian and Kirsten at the University of Virginia and we are putting together this book club to see if people can read a book and then we want to pair that with actions that they can take at the end of that reading and then we want to see mm-hmm. if they will actually take that actions because I kind of feel like once you're immersed in this book and you're told, okay, you can do something to help. <laughs> Will you do it? Yeah. That's um, fascinating. I would love to find out more about that. Um, because I think, I use, I usually think that what prevents us from taking action is the b- belief that it won't make a difference, um, mm-hmm. that we can't actually help. Or um, or in, in some work that I did previously, um, Many, many years ago, like I was working in case management with uh, people who recently paroled from prison with mental health or substance use disorders. And um, and I always didn't know if I was perpetuating um, a system or if I was genuinely uh, taking positive action. I don't know. And I think that I think that confusion and the belief that maybe not, it doesn't matter, our actions don't make a difference. I think those two things really prevent actually taking action. Yeah. No, and I agree with and you because I hear that a lot as well. Like, Especially when you look at the scale of it, sometimes you're like, okay, what do I do? If I, if I take this one little action, is it even going to make a difference? Um but at the same time, I also listen to a lot of people who say, you know, all of these small actions, if you add them up, <laughs> they can yeah. turn into something bigger, much bigger than we imagined. And when I, um, 
when I read, like, I, I, I enjoy, like, um, reading from different spiritual beliefs and religions. And it, there seems to be a common thread, the belief that um, somehow uh, embodying what we are saying, that is the greatest way to contribute right. to. So, like, if you want peace, be peace. Right. Um, and we have to think about all the ways in which, you know, um, if I if I want to live in a world where all life is equal, right. like in what ways am I not embodying that in my own world? Um, and if I'm honest with myself, every day I have examples of how I'm not embodying that, you know. Right. So and then, but I yeah. So I think then it becomes how can I take the action to be that to to, to work on myself daily, but also take the action that's providing immediate assistance right. when you're able to, you know. I don't. Yeah. yeah yeah no it's 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 very fascinating and of course you also we also get into discussions like okay what do you do as an individual when you're dealing with systemic structure issues that our governments um need to deal with and what can you know what role do we play in that uh as yeah. individuals right um and i don't know because uh or you know I hear from so many people who believe in um, social movements, mm -hmm. like creating positive change, but I also hear from a lot of people who are fully in agreement with um, with the, uh, the change that needs to occur and work toward it in many different ways and don't believe that actually like marching mm -hmm. or um, collective work in that mm -hmm. way works. And I, and I don't know when I listen to both, yeah. I think both are, and sometimes both can be true yeah. at the same time and um so i don't i don't know like and i wonder if it's i don't think we can say it's just case by case yeah. um but it's hard to say what the right action is or what the impactful action is yeah and i agree with that as well and also like again you know as i speak to people as well on on fiction and can fiction do something one of one of the things that some people have highlighted is actually like yeah maybe it can action can be taken but sometimes it may not even be the action you would like to be <laughs> to be taken <laughs> right right that's true I think this is a good moment for us to speak about your own work. Um, and I know we said we're going to talk about Telic. Am I pronouncing that right? Telic, Telic yeah. yeah. So I know it's a short story, but um, what is this story about? Um, this story is about a young woman, um, I think like mid-teens, mm -hmm. and in a uh, village in Iran that is predominantly Armenian uh, and Christian. And they live with the neighboring um, villages that are m mostly of Turkic um, ethnicity and, um, and different religions, Zoroastrian, Muslim. Of course, the predominant um, religion in the country is Iran, uh, I'm sorry, is Muslim and um, and so it's her experience of being an ethnic and religious minority in um, in a village which has long-standing conflict with the neighboring uh, people. Mm -hmm. And um, part of what inspired this work is is I really wanted to understand compassion, mm -hmm. and um, and I'm Armenian. From Iran, so I was raised with a lot of different beliefs about um, uh, about Turkic mm -hmm. people and with our long-standing history, and um, and it, in in an effort to embody what I talk about all the time, I want to develop compassion and understand. And I think part of me thought if I could go back to the beginning, if I could really understand. Which, as I was telling you earlier, the conflict really begins um, back with when Genghis Khan mm -hmm. came to the region, um, and so I want to understand that, and I want to, I want to understand that um, we too embody abuses of power in in our own small communities, mm -hmm. to embody um, 
hierarchies and violence and um and i think in a way in an effort to truly be compassionate um i have to see those in myself and and so that's what the story um that was the inspiration for the story was to to see the life of this woman and how these things are a part of it and how she moves um, or the decisions and choices she makes are in an effort to slowly empower mm-hmm. herself. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's such a beautiful story. I enjoyed reading it, reading it a lot. And I really appreciate what you say about um, compassion and all of us embodying abuses of power, hierarchy and violence. I wrote all of that down and really interrogating at um, at our individual levels in a way, what can we do? Um, And a lot of people that I admire and read about often say, like in in the spaces we occupy, how are we carrying ourselves, you know, whether it's with our colleagues, in our families, in our friends, on, on the train? How are we using the power sometimes we have? Um, but also how are we being compassion, compassionate to to others? And I think that's one of the things that I... I think compassion is one of the things that perhaps can help a lot <laughs> in, in, mm. in, in, in at least suddenly helping or dealing with people who are suffering. Yeah. Yes. I think um, compassion, um, and it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning is that's, I believe that's the only way to not make assumptions and not hold judgments. Um, And the only way forward, I mean, if we want to really live in a world that doesn't experience war, we have to be a people who ask each other questions and don't fill in the blank. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and and so, so much of, I mean, to be honest, everything I grew up with, I've met less than a handful of maybe Turks my entire life. I've, um, most of the reading I've done on the topic was written by people who review the history or view the history the same way that I was raised to view it. You know, I have to be really honest with myself in the ways in which I understand this and the ways in which I want to understand yeah. it to be more of who I want to be in this world. You know, you just remind me, and I digress for one moment from Telic. Um, I was reading um, a review you did of, Dan, is it Dan, 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 there's a review you did. Oh, Danut. Yeah, and one thing I was reading your your review sure. of it and one thing that struck me was this character who's if I remember who's and I'd love to read that book by the way, but who um I think his parents were killed by Russian by Russian soldiers, I think. And he's from Poland. He grew up in Poland, I believe, and for all of his life he really wanted he grew up Believing, you know, these people, you know, the Russians killed his 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 mother, if, if I remember, and wanting to to revenge, if I remember, and then it dawns on to him that actually it was the Polish uh, who had killed his parents. Yes, yes, I remember. I think they were wearing uh, the uniforms yes. of Russian soldiers. They were Polish. Yes, yeah, yeah. I just got goosebumps. I had forgotten about yeah. that, but it's. Uh, yeah, I think um, this idea of uh, the narratives that, and I think, you know, the perspectives we have to change, the, getting to the point where we can be honest with ourselves with what's, um, what role we've all played, you know. Yeah, no, I, mean, I really you know, I appreciate you for really, really saying this because, you know, the assumptions we make, as you're saying, the narratives we read and what we want to read or what we want to hear, all play into um, the decisions of how we see life. All people who, you know, especially when you have these layers of ethnicity, tribalism, rest, I think the more you pay attention to what you're reading, what you're hearing, the, you know, the assumptions you're making without questioning, I think that's really can only make us 
um, like we can really make us be more compassionate. Yes, yeah, and I think that's the only way to not perpetuate um, the the systems and hierarchies that create these crises to begin with. So I think this is a good moment for you to read an excerpt from, from Telic. The damp air brought the fragrance of jasmine flowers and Telic inhaled deeply. She traced the scent to apricot hair with oily roots that rivered down a thin back, dancing in the inward curve of a deep spine. Not straight and not curly. It took a life and texture of its own. The woman's heavy almond eyelids hung like she was living in a dream, a place far away. She kept her jewelry on as she bathed, long strands of gold earrings and a necklace. A shorter necklace clung to her neck, the three feathered wings of Faruhar. Dipping a worn out loofah in her bucket and sprinkling it with salt, she scrubbed the dead skin from her hands and elbows, thighs and knees. The subtle movements of her small upright breasts mesmerized Telik, who shifted on the bench, let out a moan. The woman washed her hair with soap and wring it out like laundry. Her feet were narrow and arched, her toes nearly the same length. They looked like feet that walked easily in the world, held up a body that knew how to be. The woman kept her feet together when she sat on the stool beneath the faucet. She kept her thighs closed. Wow. Um, what's going on in this paragraph? Um, so Telik, uh, she's, she had been silent for two years. She'd been traumatized um, when a, a neighboring village had come in in the middle of the night and no one was hurt, but just the fear of it. Um, she hadn't spoken in two years. And um, in an effort to help her, her mother took her to the church. Um, and after, like, the priest received a donation, he prayed for her and said, you know, if she doesn't start talking, just get her married. And um, so there are all these elements of her life that are out of her control, uh, all these hierarchies that she's born into and all these um, expectations and um, Kind of really what this story demonstrates is Telik as this young woman in the, in the village. Um, her family is not wealthy by any means. Um, and the really at, for lack of a better way of explaining this, really at the mercy of traditions and the hierarchies, which is the church, the patriarchy. the um, And she's mesmerized by this woman. Um, and this is becomes the catalyst to her speaking again after two years of silence. Um, and I think what she's mesmerized by is this woman's sense of agency, where she has control over herself as a woman, control in her body. And at the same time, um, she's somewhere far away in the sense of maybe she has these, um, her spirituality seems to be, uh, something that's embodied in her, though she's doing very practical movements like uh, scrubbing the dead skin and, um, you know, washing her hair with soap. And so even in these daily practices that are not much more luxurious than what Telik would do as she bathed, um, there is a sense of elegance, a sense of luxury um, and and that agency. And I think... Um, what we see for me is that the ways in which um, the woman, uh, we find out more about her later in another story, but she's Persian. And then I think the idea of being a minority that chips away at levels of agency and then we embody it in ourselves where we don't really have agency in the way we carry ourselves and the way we see ourselves and the way we experience um, different elements of the world. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm glad you talk about agency because that's the other thing that I it comes up a lot in terms of, um, especially again, when it comes to people affected by crisis. But at the same time, even if you're not affected by a crisis, but I guess because if you're in a conflict, there's just much more going on. And if you're a recipient of humanitarian assistance, again, there's so much more going on. So there's always a question like, how can we help people, you know, tell their own stories and be empowered to actually be in control? If of anything, at least the story they want 
to be told of, of their history, of their culture, and of their being as individuals. Yes, um, and I think that's what, maybe one of the greatest perspective shifts are the ones we can have of ourselves, of, um, you know, how many times in our own day-to-day -day lives, someone will have a memory or an understanding of one of our own experiences or actions that's so different from, um, hmm. from our own and not having the chance to share that narrative, um, I think is a really disempowering experience. Hmm. Um, it, yeah, and um, so I think being in a situation where you are um, in need of assistance in a, in a crisis I think maybe the best thing is being able to feel that you have some agency or that um, you have a story and it's true yeah. and it's valid and it, it's worthy of being told. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and in fact, that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you, but you've already answered it, like how she gets her, basically how she takes control or how she's empowered by the end of, of the story. The other one I know you've mentioned is the trauma um, that I think almost the family, the, the entire family is going through. Uh, you know, the mother slaps her when this, um, um, when the, you know, when it starts and they hear the the group coming. Um, so she slaps her and and then she says, "Unnecessary child, shut your voice." Um, and actually, as I was reading it, I'm like, is it literal? Like, does she say shut your voice? And actually, <laughs> but could you talk to me? I mean, could you talk more about that? I, um, so those are pretty common sayings in Armenian, uh, that parents say to their children. Um, it, you know, at least traditionally, those are, those are mm -hmm. very common sayings. And I tried to, in, in translating, I wanted to keep I have a hard time with translating because I think it's mm -hmm. very powerful the the actual words that are used, though they may, they land differently, you know, in English yeah. than they do in Armenian. But yes, I think, um, and I think through generations of trauma, this, I have seen this to be true and different. Um, and it goes back to, I think, also the agency and that level of experiences of marginalization where, um, it seems that parents may feel the greatest love is really being hard um, yeah. on your child. Um, and I think part of it is that part of it is really that that is the way to love them and help them survive yeah. in the world. To teach them through that harshness almost. Um, and I think also in other ways is the embodiment of maybe not consciously, but perpetuating the, the sentiment of what um, you've internalized about yourself and your community and your family. And Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you've mentioned it again, um, when the priest, first of all, they go to see the priest and the mother explains the problem and he doesn't seem to do anything until he's given some money. <laughs> And then he prays, as you said earlier, and then he's like, look, if this doesn't work, just marry her off. Uh, what's going on there? Um, that also tends to be a common, um, what we see with like mental health issues in the community. Um, traditionally, it's okay, get them married. That will, that'll take care of it. Um, substance use disorders, get them married. That'll take care of it. Any kind of... Um, any anything I think that's emotional mm. or spiritual, um, it's the idea that marriage. I don't know if it's the the idea that the responsibility of another is what might make the person heal or or improve their situation, or um, or if that's. And a lot of times, if you are you know in a village where there isn't, uh, it's not about career and education and um, the greatest. Uh, experience one may have yeah. is their wedding. In, so I think um, a lot of those come into play. And I think here it was, you know, she's a woman. Her her duty is to be married, to, to serve a husband, to have children. Um, let her get yeah. on with it. 
it, it doesn't really matter if she's speaking or not that that to me felt like right. the sentiment behind the priests right and yeah. as you said Ali already she gets agency back she by the end of this story she's empowered and she cuts her hair what's going on there she um so the way I understand it is she was so inspired by the woman mm. in the baths um, that she rushes home and she looks out the window and sees her mom uh, and her mom's, you know, like wearing her uh, her dad's shoes with like the backs folded down and um, she's feeding the hens and not really um, resembling the the kind of feminine agency that the woman mm. at the bathhouse had. And I think in that moment, she really decides this is not what I what I want. Um, and so she cuts off her hair, which to um, culturally, hair is a, a symbol of feminism. It's um, one beauty, power, so many things go into the notion of hair. And cutting it is rejecting, I don't want to be married, I don't want to fit this idea i want to have agency over my body and i think it begins there right. for her and her mother thinks she's gone insane <laughs> yes so that's, that's her, mother, her mother's response when she sees the haircut is uh what have i done my yeah. daughter's insane. it's a curse from <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's such I mean honestly I enjoyed yeah. reading it I had so to read it a few times um because it, it you cover so much I mean you have this amazing skill to cover so much and bring out so much in such a short story and I really enjoyed reading it and of course now also talking to you about it to see what actually is going on for these characters I think um and since I've since I shared it with you, I've added a bit ah. more to it. I think it might be better than it than it is. Um, but I think um, I, it just has a special place. I don't know. I think um, I feel like I understand yeah. the characters in a very yeah. intimate way, um, which which has made it really exciting yeah. to write. No, I mean I I would love to read uh, the next iteration of it and one day when it goes out in the world I'd love to read it yeah thank you so Ani I'm coming to the end of our conversation in fact I really have just maybe two or one more question for you one of which is and we probably touched upon it a bit already um, but the question of like if someone is really whoever will listen to this conversation if there was one thing they could do to address the causes and consequences of humanitarian crisis, what would that one action be? I honestly believe um, that the best action we can take is to, um, you know, become aware of when we're mm -hmm. filling in the blanks for people and just ask questions. Um, I think asking questions, the more we ask of ourselves yeah. and of others and of information that we're consuming, um, I think that I really believe that might be the best um, right. way forward. And do you have any questions for me? Um, <laughs> let's see. Do you, uh, do you have a book that you feel... Um, is most influential in, in uh, taking action, like that's set in a crisis and really has a call to action? In terms of a book taking action, I, I mean, I've just read um, The Displacements and, and I also say it, it's just really on my mind because I just finished reading it. Um, also, it's coming out in July officially and it's really dealing with climate change and and the hurricane. And I think reading it, it's written in, in the present, it's set in, in, in today. And I think there's something about 
stories set in the present. I think there's just kind of the sheer urgency that comes through. And I guess when you read a story on climate change set today, it's urgent. You're already seeing on seeing what's going on in in what's going on around us almost every day in terms of uh, all of these climate related events. So that's just a book I would recommend um, because it's it's very topical. I would say it's very urgent, but the writer does a really incredible job, and it's set in America as well, which I found very interesting for me to read because most of the <laughs> There's a lot of literature I read. Um, fiction is set in, in, in other countries. Or if it's in America, you know, maybe veterans and people who have dealt with or America's role in some of these wars. Um, and so it's also set in America. It's dealing with um, a lot of kind of the day-to-day, -day, you know, looking at, you know, internet, how does that impact access to services and so because of the way it's set up I think if someone read it and they really really wanted to do if it doesn't make them to stop and think about what we are faced with when it comes to climate change uh, I would be really surprised I have to say but I think as we were discussing earlier for me is that how do you take that learning from a book from a story and then channel it into action. And this is one of the things I'm trying to work with other colleagues and to see how can we figure out a way of uh, reading and then actually <laughs> taking action. Like how do you capture that, that interest, that um, empathy or compassion that characters you've lived with on the page that you feel you wanna help mm -hmm. on the page and then actually turn that into doing something. And I think that's where, I guess, to me, more work needs to be done. But I also feel like yes. conversations like this help a lot. Um, so I find that when I go to book, book readings and conversations, I get so much out of those conversations. And... Mm -hmm. I have this uh, Professor Adrian at the University of Virginia who did this study with students who really, because of reading together as students, as a community, they got, there was so much impetus about them wanting to actually take action after that community reading and that community discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great um, perspective that didn't occur to me but the conversations that take place because yeah. of literature could be the yeah. catalyst too that's such a great point that i completely had not thought of that's yeah. very hopeful uh that's it for me unless you have any more questions for me no thank you this was um really no, thank a, a pleasure you. and if someone would like to know more about your work and your company where can they find you um, uh, my website, um, theholisticceo.com or, um, and my email is there. And so I would love to hear from anybody interested in having such conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ani. Thank you so much for your time. It's really, really been a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Ani today on Saha, Stories and Humanitarian Action. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'd also like to thank Jamal Swift, my co-producer, and the Nomadic Band for the music. Thank you.